Nos waith da, gyfeillion anwyl. I couldn't really start talking about Welsh witches without talking about a very, very famous uh, witch character from this area. The witch of Corsfochno, or the witch of what we might call Barth Bog uh, these days, was actually a very infamous character, let's say, in, uh, in this area for what appears to be a very, very long time. Up until relatively recently, people still believed that there was a witch living out on uh, Korsvachna, on Barth Bog. But she wasn't really a, a mortal character. So this isn't an old woman who happens to have developed a reputation, um, either rightly or wrongly, deservedly or not. Um, this is really more of a, an imaginary character, a fictional character, uh, perhaps even a mythological character. We'll discuss that in a moment. Um, but someone who is really a part of the imagined life of the community. And someone who was, you know, in many ways had a very profound effect on people's lives. Uh, Karsvachna, or... Barth Bog is, of course, uh, in mid Wales, um, not far from Tretaliesin. And, of course, behind Tretaliesin, up in the hills, we've got Baird Taliesin. And then, basically, across um, from Tretaliesin, if you're looking out to see, that whole area is Karsvachna, is Barth Bog. A lot of the land between um, the main bog and the Dovey estuary on the top of that image has been reclaimed as farmland. So you can see there, you can see lots of little squares, which are the, the, the new fields, but that's a, a modern reclamation. Up until relatively recently, the bog stretched all the way from the hills on the south of the image all the way up to the Dovey estuary. It's a very famous um, a swamp or bog in, in Welsh literature. Many prophecy poems mention Korsvachna as somewhere where a great uh, portentous battle will take place. So it's long lived in the Welsh imagination, this swamp. And I think that the character that we're going to, look to begin with this evening is part of that tradition in many ways. The story we're going to begin with comes from... Uh, a collection by Evan Isaac, who lived in Tretaliesin. It's not the greatest photo there. It's the best one I could find, though. Evan Isaac was uh, a minister, a Wesleyan minister in the area, and he lived in Tretaliesin, just on the east of Barthbog of Korsvachna. So he would have been very familiar with the tradition that we're going to begin with this evening about the old witch of Korsvachna, Hain Wrach Agors. And Evan Isaac, like many scholars of his day, like many people interested in Welsh folklore, really saw it as uh, superstition. And of course, a lot of it was superstition. Um, but also belittled the locals who still believed in these things and really looked down upon them. He describes very interesting pieces of folk belief and folklore in the northern Ceredigion area. He describes several people who still believe in uh, in rheibio or cursing. He talks of many farmers who still think that many of the ail ailments that their, uh, their farm animals, their stock suffered from was the cause of witches. So it was a very widespread belief throughout Wales up until pretty much the Second World War, I think, particularly in the more rural areas where people still believed not only in uh, some old women and their magical abilities, but believed in these quite monstrous supernatural figures. And in many ways, these most monstrous mythical figures did come from quite an old strand in Welsh culture, I believe, and did stand for some quite archetypal uh, concepts and ideas. But anyway, before we go too deep, too quickly, let's go and have a look at this story about the old witch of Korsvachna. As Evan Isaac puts it in Coilian Cymru, and this is a story I've translated myself, the locals knew that the swamp was the home of Urhen Wrach, the old witch, 
and it was commonly believed that she was all-knowing and all-powerful within the confines of the marsh. She never came out unless it was the dead of night, and had to, uh, and it had to be a pitch-black night, thick with mist. Such was her shame at being seen, so ugly was she, that she never moved neither by day nor by moonlight. Because there was no shortage of fog or mist during the years the old witch was in her full power, we'll talk about what this means in a, in a moment, there appears to be a particular period where she was believed in uh, by quite a, a large uh, portion of the local population. She had frequent opportunities during this period to come out, and how vicious was she that seldom did she let these opportunities pass in vain. And she was so vicious that should be sorry, it's a bad translation on my part. I heard that Betsan, Sein Van Adel, saw her once. Betsan lived in a run-down cottage on the edge of the marsh, and one grey night when she was returning home from gathering gore stumps for a fire the next day, she saw next to her, sitting on a sedge mound, a woman with a huge head and hair as dark as jet, falling in one long and thick torrent down her back and gathering in a cluster on the ground. She was eating bog beans and toadstools. In passing, Betsan greeted her. Good night. Quite a brave woman, if you ask me, to be uh, greeting uh, such a monstrous character in this way, but there you go. Brave old Betsan greeted her good night. The witch jumped on her feet, a full seven feet in height, and thin and bony and yellow of skin, and turned to Betsan and bared her teeth as black as soot, and blew in her face like a serpent, and disappeared into the swamp. It is said that Betsan was never the same after that night. So clearly this is a folk character in the full sense of the word, quite a cartoonish character in many ways, a monstrous character. But the witch of Barthbarg was really an embodiment of death in many ways. She appears to have stood for a very specific illness that people in the area suffered. This is how Evan Isaac um, describes the illness. The villagers of Taliesin in particular were afflicted for generations by a common disease. It was a kind of fever, its symptoms very peculiar and nasty. It began in a faint and clammy feeling, similar to seasickness, and then there was great trembling throughout the whole body which lasted for one hour. The tremor would occur once every 24 hours and an hour later every day. It's continued in this way for eight or ten days. And there's lots of folklore around this illness, and some people have postulated that uh, it was something uh, that was caused by the burning of peat, of peat bog. Um, uh, Many people were too poor to buy coal, so peat was the readily available uh, fuel for fire, and countless uh, historians have described, or people writing at the time, commentating at the time, have described uh, the great pea supers that would occur when people were burning this type of, um, of peat. And this illness that was brought on, perhaps by the burning of peat, was known as Erhen Wrach. It was known as the Old Witch. But it appears as if this illness was associated with a character that already existed in the folklore of the area. And I say that because the Old Witch of Barthbog isn't the only character of this type. Now, of course, some of you are familiar with the... Taliesin myth might be thinking to yourselves, well, this could be a Keridwen type character, and maybe Keridwen is in the mix there somewhere. This is a witch who is essentially the cause of death. She is an embodiment of death in many ways. Um, and Keridwen in the tale of Taliesin takes on a similar role. Of course, the figure that we have here is far less refined and far less sophisticated. But as well as Keridwen being in the mix there somewhere, which I wouldn't doubt at all, Keridwen being also closely associated with this area. I would say that the Witch of Korsvachna is one variant on a far more widespread cartoonish character that bears many names in the Welsh tradition. Perhaps the most popular name that she's known by is Gwrach Rhipin. 
And we get one of the better descriptions of this Gorach Ribin, the witch of the Ribin. I'll talk about what Ribin means in a moment. From uh, the work of Mardin Varth or John Jones, who lived on the Llyn Peninsula, who was uh, an antiquarian. He was also a blacksmith uh, and a poet. Quite a good poet as well, in my opinion, um, of his time, of course. And Mardin Varth wrote this great book called Llyn Gwerin Sir Ganarvon, or the, the folklore of of Carnarvonshire and he goes into a great deal of detail on many things it's a brilliant book in many ways it's such a shame that there isn't an English translation but there you go maybe one day when I'm old and retired I'll have time to translate some of these books for uh, for you folks who can't read Welsh but he describes Gracher he been like this it is thought that she lived in the thick fog now just like the old witch of Corsfachna there is a, a strong connection to the mist. Of course, the Tilwith Teg are also associated with the mist. So perhaps this is a feature of some of the supernatural characters of Wales, not just the Tilwith Teg, but these witches as well. There's obviously a, a connection there. If ever was seen but heard screeching loudly, and her scream was always regarded as a portent of some evil about to befall they that heard her. She seems to represent an andras, or a vash, pestilence, the mother of evil, the witch, etc. So as Mardin Vard points out, there are many names for this folk character, but she appears to have the same uh, qualities and characteristics in many of the different traditions. Gwrach y Rhibyn um, is the Carnarvonshire name, of course. The names given to her indicate that she was one to be hated more than loved, and that, it was, and that it was not without cause that she was known as the Flying Phantom. This was a terrible sight, her withered arms, long nails, long black hair, black teeth, and the deathly pallor of her appearance made her a harsh and terrifying thing. The name is a rough description of her trailing voice. So maybe Grach Ribbin, the witch of the Ribbin. Ribbin might mean something like a ribbon, which is long and loose and trailing. But other explanations for her name are Grach um, Ribbin. So a Ribbin there being a, um, a mutated form of a Ribbin. And Ribbin essentially means howling or wailing. So the, the, the wailing witch might be another meaning for her name. Because it's her wail, it's her screech, which uh, is the portent of death, of course. The name is a rough description of her trailing voice, which was shocking enough to freeze the veins of all who heard it. The witch herself was rarely seen, so it's this screeching, this screaming that the name is really associated with. But at a crossroads, or at estuaries, where she would beat the water with her hands... She was heard singing a mourning song for those about to die. So, of course, crossroads, liminal places, the estuaries where rivers either run into the sea or rivers meet other rivers. These are obviously liminal places where we can imagine these supernatural characters were portrayed as stalking or living. It's interesting that she beats the water with her hands and that she is associated with estuaries in particular. Because again, there might be a little bit of Keridwen in there. There might be a little strand of Keridwen. Keridwen, of course, being very closely associated with water. And not just water, but rivers running into the sea. So uh, Talies, uh, Guyanbach, or the reborn Guyanbach, being set on a river uh, and passing out into the other world, essentially, by floating out to sea. So there might be some connection there. Not explicit, of course, but it might be one reason for that element in particular. If a scream was heard without words, it was probably the listener himself who was warned of his own death. Grach um, Ribin would sometimes scream... Uh, specific words or names like wife or mother or sister, and this was part to be uh, supposedly part of the portent. This witch turned the riverbeds, throwing into them large stones when flying from one mountain to another. 
this throwing of stones is something that uh, that's closely associated with giants. So another strand of Welsh folklore associated here with Gwrach Ribbin. But once again, generally speaking, another very cartoonish character, stereotypical character that we can find in the folklore uh, of Europe in general, if not across the world, you know, women with the evil eye and what have you. The whole notion of witches is very popular in many places across the world. And this isn't uniquely Welsh, these types of descriptions. I think Gwrach Rhybyn may be more Welsh in the sense that she also has this connection to great stones and monoliths changing the courses of rivers sometimes, or at least that's what's suggested. That might be part of her lore. But these cartoonish characters are really characters that embody death. They are um, mythological in, in a very weak sense, in that they are embodiments of death and that they mark death, that if you come across them, they are signs of your own death. And this is one aspect of the character of the witch. This is one way in which they're described, not only in Wales, but in loads of places across the world. And it's very difficult to find positive aspects of this character. Of course, um, Keritwen in the tale of Taliesin, she has this aspect to her. And I think that this is one strand in Keritwen's uh, uh, character in many ways but Keridwen is also a mother and Keridwen is also a great sorceress and Keridwen is also a provider of magical enlightenment through the potion of inspiration and she is not uh, um, a woman without feeling, she is not purely an embodiment of death because of course even though she hates Guillaume she doesn't want to kill him and she effectively stands in as a, a figure who embodies reincarnation as well as death so when looking at the law concerning witches I think it's important to remember that not all witches look like this and not all witches are like this, although this is the most common version of the witch that we have in Wales. But there's one other story that I want to share with you this evening before I draw this to a close. And it's a very intriguing story. If you remember, I spoke about um, a story regarding uh, an old woman who was a witch who used to help her grandson make money uh, by transforming herself into a hare and rich sportsmen would turn up in the area and pay her grandson to uh, to start up a hare so they could uh, entertain themselves with hare coursing uh, and the grandmother was obviously uh, quite ready to help her grandson to earn a little bit of money on the side but of course the sportsmen ask um, a conjurer and or a wise man, a Dean Huspis, and the Dean Huspis knows how to catch this witch, and that is by uh, hunting the hare uh, that she's transformed herself into with a pure black hound. Well, there is another version of that story shared by Mardin Vardh. Another man awoke early in the morning to get to the market in Carnarvon, but shortly after setting out in the morning, he saw a hare running across the road and he immediately fell into disrepair and depression and thought of turning back. However, he went on very depressed. And after the end of the market, the neighbour asked him, how did the market go? Sorry, I haven't translated this very well, have I? I've just done it too quickly. I knew well that I was to have a bad market today since I saw a hare on the way this morning. The sight of a hare crossing your path or coming to meet you before breakfast, according to the old folk, meant a gelaness, a she-enemy. But in the evening, it meant a breniness, a queen. That is, misfortune in the morning and good faith in the evening. So... This means that in Carnarvonshire, at least, there are two aspects to this witch who can transform herself into hares. The hare, uh, as a transformed witch, is associated with good luck and bad luck. And the good luck portion is associated with this notion of a queen, a brenhines, which I think is really interesting. A geloness, 
a, a she enemy or a queen. So who is this queen? Why a queen? Why a brenhines? Very difficult to say. I obviously have my own guesses as to what this could mean. But we're obviously talking about a supernatural female character of high status. Supernatural female characters of high status are, of course, quite common in the early tradition of Wales. Uh, we need only look at the four branches of the Mabinogi to find several supernatural high-ranking female characters. So there may be something behind the more monstrous aspect to the quite common figure of the witch in Welsh folklore, which hasn't been preserved for us that well, but is hinted at in some of these Carnarvonshire um, stories. Is the witch a variation on the, uh, the fairy bride? Is the supernatural woman associated with these other supernatural women in the Welsh tradition? There is no explicit connection here, but I think it's really interesting that for some reason the good luck hair that you saw in the evening was called a queen, whereas the bad luck hair before breakfast was called an enemy. <laughs>